Uh, good evening and welcome to the 331st meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text and image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is Ika Exna, who is a historian of East Asian, European, and North American graphic narrative of the 19th and early 20th centuries. He writes about and translates old cartoons and comic strips on the Instagram account at prewar underscore manga. He is currently working on a comprehensive history of manga. And tonight he'll be talking about his recent book uh, on comics and the origins of modern manga. So take it away, Aika. Thank you so much for that introduction and for the invitation. Right, so the reason why I've labeled this presentation today origins of modern comics, including manga, rather than origins of manga, is that it's really impossible to tell the history of manga without also telling the history of comics elsewhere. But if you've read the vast majority of manga histories, this might come as a surprise. So for example, uh, a few days ago, Google Arts and Culture, um, because who better to teach arts and culture than a tech company, uh, and Japan's Ministry of Education, Trade and Industry, or METI, together published a project called Manga Out of the Box, and it includes this history of manga in manga. And these are uh, sort of an endless scroll on your phone uh, where the background slightly changes. So these are four different screenshots. Uh, showing the the beginning of that manga history. And I think this is, I'm including this because I think it's a fairly representative example of uh, the type of manga history that most people are probably familiar with. So it starts with the roots and the, the first thing you're told is the roots go deep and it connects manga to scrolls from the 12th century. And then it jumps to ukiyo-e, and then it jumps to hokusai, the hokusai manga. And from there, it goes to Ipiri Maizumi and Lakten Kitazawa, and from there just skips all the way to Osamu Tezuka over here. And uh, you might notice if you do a little bit of critical reading of this that often, um, well, first of all, manga isn't really defined, right? So uh, we're, not really, we're not really told what manga actually is or how these things are connected. There's uh, manga's most recognized precedent, and then the era of manga, and then modern manga. Uh, and then it just goes to Tezuka, uh, to Osamu Tezuka. And we're told that sort of American and European influence only comes with what is called the Western occupation, even though, I mean, it was just the United States, but the Western occupation of Japan then brought American and European influence to manga after World War II. Uh, and I'd like to start with something that I've been using as sort of a, an Im immediate example of what's what my issue is with that type of history, which is a list of the longest running manga before 1945. So if you read the type of history that I've just shown to you, uh, that sponsored by the Japanese Ministry of, Edu um, of Economy, Trade and Industry, you'd probably think, well, certainly something by uh, Akin Kitazawa must be on here, and then some other Japanese strips. And actually the, the third longest running manga of the prior period, uh, Norakuro Ret Maisuho Tagawa, published in the boys magazine Shonen Club, that did run for about 10 years and is the third longest running manga pre-1945. But when we get to the second longest running manga, that actually was a comic strip by the Swedish author um, and cartoonist Oscar Jacobson, which ran for uh, over 12 years in the Asahi Graph. And it was also labeled a manga. Here it says manga. So this was understood as a manga at the time. And um, it's the second longest running manga of the pre-war period. And then the longest running manga of the pre-war period was actually uh, the American comic strip Bringing Up Father, written by George McManus. And this ran for over 17 years, also in the Asahi Graph also labeled a manga, an American manga, translated as Oyeji Kyoiku, a fairly literal translation of Bring Up Father. So you immediately know that the, the two longest running manga were actually foreign works, which uh, should, or which immediately suggests that 
there's something that these official quote unquote official histories of manga aren't really telling you. And there's also an honorable mention that goes to Happy Hooligan, which ran for uh, five years, which makes it the longest running, uh, sorry, the second longest running manga of the 1920s after Bringing a Father. And uh, a quick note about image quality. So this is what a lot of these strips looked like in the original, nicely scanned. Unfortunately, a lot of my images were taken by phone off computer screens. That's why a lot of these images will look like this. But um, a lot of these images are pretty hard to get because uh, these strips were published uh, by newspapers and magazines in the 1920s and 1930s. So a lot of them are only available on microfilms. Uh, which is why you won't find a lot of these images online, unfortunately. So in order to understand what happened in the 1920s and 1930s in Japan, uh, unfortunately, we have to go back to the very basics for a moment and ask ourselves, what are comics and what are manga? And I actually think that trying to define comics, and I talked a little bit about this with Ben earlier, is ultimately pointless because there will always be edge cases. And uh, if you've read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, you're familiar with this um, scene where he tries to define comics uh, to really narrow it down and include everything that he considers comics while excluding everything he doesn't consider comics. And my issue with this kind of definition is that you end up including stuff that most people probably would not consider comics, like the Bayou Tapestry in McCloud's case, and that also aren't directly historically connected to what we call comics today. And something similar usually happens with manga where people will define manga as sort of anything like funny images or whimsical pictures that really then just includes a lot of stuff across history and doesn't really help us understand where the things that we call comics or manga today come from. On the other hand, I do think definitions are useful in defining sort of an archetype. So when we talk about comics or manga, we can identify certain feature uh, certain features that people will usually think of when they refer to comics or manga because after all comics and manga are both like almost all concepts that humans use their social con constructs right there's no platonic ideal of the comic or the manga um, that then uh, defines what is a comic and what is a manga and what is not so some examples of um, useful characteristics, um, well, characteristics that I think are useful are images in sequence, the primacy of images over narrative text, because usually if something has way more text than images, we probably won't call it a comic or manga, but rather uh, an illustrated story or something to that effect. And also speech balloons and motion lines. So I don't mean to say that something has to have all of these elements that actually be a comic or be a manga, right? You can immediately show me something that doesn't have speech balloons, and people will probably still uh, be able to call it comic. But nonetheless, I think that this is a useful archetype of what a comic and or a manga in the sense that most people will, will think of these things today uh, represents. And these characteristics then allow us to trace uh, the development of these elements over time. And so uh, in order to really understand where these manga and comics come from, we have to go back to the, 18, uh, the 1800s and look at the appearance of picture stories and cartoons in Europe at the time. So uh, most of you will probably be familiar with this history, which is why uh, I'll try to keep it brief. In the 1830s, picture stories start becoming popular in Europe, first uh, by Rudolf Tupfer, uh, and then in the uh, 1860s and 1880s, which is when Wilhelm Busch is most active. So these two authors um, really popular as picture stories. Um, they're writing in, in French and German, but their, their work gets translated into other languages and their work spreads all across Europe and North America as well. Um, these are some examples of Tupfer. This is sort of an archetypical picture story where you have images and text. You have this narration and they work together. They're strictly separated usually, and you kind of have to read both, and especially the, the narration in order to understand the, the entire plot. And here are some elements, uh, some examples from Bush. This is from Bush's most famous work, Max of Moritz. And again, it's very similar to Tupfer. It looks a little bit more uh, what we now would call cartoony, uh, but it's the same, the same pattern, essentially. You have these images and texts that are completely separate, and you have to refer to both to really understand the story. This is some more work by Bush. Okay, so you might be wondering, 
uh, sorry, oh, there are here some more examples first. So since I said uh, they spread all over Europe, these are examples from European humor magazines in the 19th century. This is Punch in Britain. This is Chalivari in France. You see the same pattern, right? You have images and texts that are separate, and you have to read the text to really understand the story. Okay, so what does this have to do with Japan, you might be wondering. Well, these stories actually start showing up in Japan as early as the 1880s. So in 1887, Bush's Maxim Moritz, which I mentioned earlier, is translated into Japanese. Uh, the reason why it's written the Latin alphabet actually is that the group that published this was trying to uh, have the traditional Japanese script replaced with the Latin alphabet, which today sounds a little bit outlandish to us, but actually, uh, if you remember in Turkey, this is actually what happened during a, a period of modernization where the traditional script was replaced with the Latin alphabet. So it's actually at the time, it didn't seem quite as uh, outlandish as it might today. And so um, during this time, we also see the first imitations of work by Bush in Japan. So on the left, you see, uh, I showed this earlier. This is a, um, an excerpt from Bush's story, The Frog and the Two Ducks. This is uh, from a Japanese story from 1893. And you can clearly see, uh, based on the similarity of these drawings, that clearly the author of the story, and again, this is just one page from a longer story, uh, was clearly looking at, at Bush's story. So already in the 1880s, we have these European picture stories in Japan. Then another element, an important precursor to modern comics are these silent multi-panel cartoons, which are usually referred to as pantomime cartoons because they silently mime, they silently depict a story without using words. And these likely uh, spread along with the spread of photography which um, and sort of an, an increase in visual culture and visual entertainment and uh, new devices such as um, photography that could record things in a mechanical way without human intervention. And so these, these type of uh, silent multi-panel cartoons start appearing in the 1860s in Europe and the US. This is uh, such a pantomime cartoon by Wilhelm Busch actually in here on the right. We have a similar pantomime cartoon by the French artist uh, Christophe. And here we have some more examples. Uh, often you can really see that this was a novelty at the time because often these stories will point out that they don't feature any text right here, story without words and here also without words. So this was quite a new thing at the time. It was also meant to appeal to readers. This is a great representation of a, a typical European humor magazine at the time, the British Comic Cuts. Here we see a pantomime cartoon on the left, but at the same time, it's featuring single panel cartoons and picture stories. And I don't mean to say that, that these are sort of inviolable definitions. For example, if you added just one line of text to this pantomime cartoon, would it make it a picture story? It, it doesn't really matter, right? These are not, you can have hybrid works, but you can clearly identify these archetypes in cartooning at the time. And again, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with Japan? And this time you might already know the answer. Of course, uh, these uh, pantomime cartoons then get established in Japan a short time later uh, as well. So starting in the 1890s, we see these pantomime cartoons and you'll recognize this is the exact same strip or rather an, an, an imitation since uh, the drawing is not exactly the same uh, in Japan. So in 1890, um, a cartoonist by the name of uh, Ipio Imaizumi, I'm using the first names first. Um, so Ipio is the first name, Imaizumi the last name. Uh, wanted to study cartooning in San Francisco, lived there for a couple of years, uh, unfortunately didn't find an apprenticeship, so had to study on his own. But when he returns to Japan, he brings with him a bunch of cartoons that he had collected during that time in San Francisco. And this, uh, this pantomime cartoon was one of them. So it is likely, since Comic Cups was British it is, and often incorporated material from elsewhere, it is likely that the original, that neither of these is the original, but that the original was actually found in a San Francisco newspaper at the time. And actually, the first time, this is really, I think, where the, the history of manga, really, the history of modern manga really begins. The word manga originally appeared in uh, the late 1700s, but it was mostly used as a synonym for sketches. 
uh, it didn't really describe any particular type of art. So the first time the word manga is actually used for cartooning and sequential art is by that very same Ipyo Imaizumi. So here on the left, we see after the, the first pantomime cartoon he published that was imported from abroad, the strongman fraud, um, Imaizumi starts writing his own pantomime cartoons, and you can kind of see his, his American training in the subtitle Perpetual Motion. And so he starts uh, using local content essentially with the same form. And then in 1891, Imaizumi publishes another pantomime cartoon. This one uh, it says here at the top, manga excerpted from a foreign newspaper. So this was also something that he very likely brought with him from San Francisco. And this is the very first time that the word manga is used for uh, sequential art like this. So it's quite ironic if you consider the, the history that I showed at the beginning and the way that manga is portrayed in a lot of histories that from the very beginning, manga as sequential art was essentially tied to works that were created outside of Japan. Okay, so now we have to get to um, the, the creation of these comic strips that I, that I already showed that um, came to Japan in the 1920s and 1930s and how comics started to move and talk. So in the late 1800s, along with these pantomime cartoons, another very important step in the formation of modern comics happens, which is the appearance of what I call transdiegetic content. And I apologize for introducing this type of jargon. Unfortunately, there was no existing word that described um, what I want to express by this, which is basically all representations of elements in cartoons that are represented in a way that is different from the way they appear to characters inside the story. So you may be familiar with the distinction between intradigetic and extradigetic, uh, intra and extra meaning inside and outside of, and the diegesis being the story world. So this is an episode from Bring a Father that I've edited to look like a picture story on the left, and then I've colored it on the right. Uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. So interdiegetic is everything that's black and white, right? So we see the story world and the characters also see everything that is depicted in these images. Then extra diegetics, all the stuff that's blue on the right here, and of course here as well, the, this text here and the panel borders, they're all extra diegetic. These characters can't see that stuff. So the red content is what I mean by trans diegetic. Because this is stuff that is simultaneously intradigetic and also extradigetic at the same time. The actual thing being represented, right? The music coming out of the piano, the words that the characters are speaking, the confusion indicated by this question mark here, these vision lines here, that is all stuff that exists within the story world. But of course, these characters don't actually see the music notes. They don't see the speech balloons. So the, the way that this intradiegetic content is represented here is extra diegetic. So this type of content I, I summarize under the label trans diegetic. And the reason why I needed this term is because the, the history of this kind of um, representation uh, coincides in the late 1800s. And even though it's often been portrayed as something that's, that's sort of naturally occurring in cartoons, it's actually very closely tied to uh, new technologies in the 19th century. So starting in the 1860s, for example, we start seeing depictions of sound in multi-panel cartoons. For example, in cartoons about the telephone. And there is an example right here. Uh, so here we all of a sudden see all these representations of sound. And this is something that is actually quite new at the time. This is in a cartoon a little bit earlier from 1869. This is actually the, the first uh, explicit representation of sound that I'm aware of in uh, in 19th century cartooning. And uh, the connection to technology is very clear on the right, but even in the, the cartoon on the left, The Philosopher's Revenge by uh, Georges du Maurier uh, becomes pretty obvious when you look at uh, these images on the right here. So in the 1800s, in the 1850s, actually, the first machine that could record sound was invented in France. And so it couldn't get replicate sound, but it, it was able to transform sound into lines on a page, or actually on a glass plate first. So using a membrane, it caught the vibrations and transmitted them to a stylus, which then would record them like this. And these uh, images here on the right were published just five years before Du Maurier wrote this cartoon. And I think the 
the incredible similarity between the way that de Maurier depicts the sound here and the way that these early recordings of sound um, were captured strongly implies that de Maurier actually was directly inspired by, by this new technological development in his depiction of sound. And in case that's not convincing enough, you think, well, maybe he wasn't, what, what's the evidence that he was actually interested in that kind of technology? Uh, about 10 years later, he publishes this cartoon, and this is also by de Maurier, where he imagines a futuristic Zoom call. So clearly this author was very interested in, in this type of, of new technology and these technological developments. And similar to this, uh, we also see motion lines um, appearing and proliferating during the same time. Um, I mean, you're, you all know what motion lines look like, but here are some examples from late 18th century cartoons. And uh, it's fairly easy to imagine how the invention of photography, right, and like motion streaks captured uh, in photographs may have directly inspired this. And there's even a picture story by Wilhelm Busch that deals directly with photography. It's uh, called Visit um, to the Photographer, where uh, this person here on the left uh, gets his picture taken. And of course, at the time, uh, it, it took quite long. So uh, he starts slouching because he's bored. And then in the last panel, Bush depicts the resulting photograph, which features a motion blur. So you have this very explicit connection uh, between technology and cartooning at the time and how these new technologies directly inspire cartoonists to include new ways of representing sound and motion on the page. One other element that is very frequent in uh, cartooning around 1900 and also in early comic strips in the early 1900s is impact for pain stars, uh, which we see um, the earliest examples that I'm aware of uh, are in the 1890s. See here, someone usually gets hit in the head and then we see these stars appearing. And uh, there's no immediate technological connection, but um, it's, it's fairly easy to understand this as um, the result of cartoonists sort of understanding that now you could actually depict things on the page that weren't actually visible, such as sound or something like a motion blur. And so um, since Imaizumi Ippyo started publishing pantomime cartoons in the Jiji Shinpo, uh, he's eventually replaced as the manga editor by Dr. Kitazawa in 1902. Uh, Kitazawa creates a cartoon section that later becomes a cartoon supplement that is called Jiji Manga. So Kitazawa continues this word manga as a um, word for cartooning and sequential art. And in the supplement, he features a lot of picture stories and pantomime cartoons. And so the association between the word manga and this type of storytelling really becomes uh, uh, established in Japan at the time. And of course, Kitazawa and other manga artists like him uh, are, they're very familiar. I mean, Kitazawa, like Imaizumi, was trained in Western cartooning. And so they're very familiar with these developments. And uh, they also use these new devices, such as motion lines. Here's, and again, sorry about the image quality. This is the Gigi Manga supplement uh, that is edited by Kitazawa. And we see this is mostly uses the, the picture story archetype, but we see motion lines here. And uh, we see the kind, same kind of impact stars here. So all of these developments in European and American cartooning are immediately relevant to the history of manga and get uh, employed by Japanese cartoonists um, fairly soon after they after they happen elsewhere. So here we see representation of sound, right? We see motion lines, we see impact stars here, and more representations of sound. And these are all these are cartoons from Tokyo Puck, which was a magazine started by Dr. Kitazawa. This is an ad in the Tokyo Puck for a phonograph. So again, here we see how these technologies are also spreading to Japan at the same time and are also directly uh, influencing the use of representations of what I call transdiegetic content. So representations of sound, for example. So now we have to get to the elephant in the room, the modern speech balloon, which is sort of the, the final missing ingredient in the creation of these first, what, what I call audiovisual comic strips. The problem with the speech balloon, of course, is that there's a very long history of word balloons. So this is probably the most controversial part of my argument. Uh, 
Um, and I think what, what really helped me understand the difference is um, the, the writing of um, the Belgian comic scholar Terry Smolderin, which I strongly recommend, who's written extensively on this, on, on the difference between older word balloons and the modern speech balloon. And uh, the main difference is essentially, I mean, they, these look like speech, like modern speech balloons, but usually or almost almost always they were used in sort of allegorical context, such as here in this political cartoon uh, or here, and they were almost never used in multi-panel cartoons. And so the way that Smolderin explains this, and I think he's right, is that these cartoons are not meant, uh, sorry, these balloons are not meant as representations of sound. We're not supposed to interpret this as a literal scene that is playing out. This is an allegory that only exists on paper. Likewise here, uh, we're not supposed to assume that all of these military figures are speaking at the same time, but it is merely an illustration of complaints that they have. And uh, there are three reasons, I think, why these balloons are not speech balloons that, that um, are useful for understanding the, the difference. If these balloons were already functioning as sound, then there, there are three problems with that. So, for example, why do we almost never see these used in conversations in multi-panel cartoons? Second, uh, why is there such little use of these balloons in cartoons that clearly show sound, such as in the cartoons that were already seen earlier, such as the Philosopher's Revenge? There are clearly conversations happening in the Philosopher's Revenge, and clearly de Maurier is depicting sound in it, so why isn't he depicting the conversations uh, using balloons as well? And then third, if these already are speech balloons, then why did the modern speech balloon have to be reinvented in the 1890s, which is exactly what happened. So the, the modern speech balloon is created in the 1890s in the New York Journal in a series of steps uh, of jokes about mistaking the source of a voice for a human being, which is something that was um, occasioned by the spread of the phonograph, uh, the first technology that could actually record sound and then also play it back. So at the time, I mean, now we're on Zoom, right? You're hearing my voice and I'm not in the room with you. So you're completely used to this experience. But at the same, uh, at the time in the 1890s, this was a, a fundamentally new experience in life. So um, it was crazy for people at the time to hear a human voice and the person not being there. We see this represented in cartoons. Uh, you're probably familiar with the yellow kid and his phonograph, which is the first of these cartoons um, where uh, the joke is basically that the kid, the yellow kid is communicating with his phonograph and ends up being a parrot inside the phonograph. And we actually see the parrot as sort of a stand in for this experience that you hear a human voice and you think it's a human, but then it ends up being a parrot in other cartoons at the time as well. However, uh, while this may sound like an argument that's been put forth by people like Bill Blackbeard, for example, that the yellow kids started modern comics, I don't think that was the case because it actually takes several years after the, this cartoon with the yellow kid until we see the first recognizably modern comic strips. And uh, Richard Felton Outcold, the uh, author of the yellow kid, actually does not continue writing comic strips immediately after this. There's actually a reduction in sound content. These are these two episodes of The Yellow Kid are uh, the only ones that explicitly feature depictions of sound. And of course, they're both tied to sound of reproduction technology. However, other artists keep making that same joke in the New York Journal. So here, um, a little bit later in early 1897, we see this cartoon, The Mysterious Trunk, and again, it's the same joke, right? And note, uh, note how it doesn't use balloons. So here we see uh, cries for help coming out of this trunk. And then in the end, it ends up being a pair. So it's the same joke, right? You hear a human voice, you think there must be a human, but it ends up not being a human. And then here on the right, we have a similar cartoon from the New York Journal, which isn't exactly that joke. Um, it's, uh, but it's also a joke about the phonographs specifically, and it doesn't feature any sound except for this one balloon here uh, that shows that the phonograph is speaking. So at the time, authors were only using these de depictions of sound to make particular types of jokes tied to this technology. And we see this again and again at the time. So here in this cartoon, also in the New York Journal, the Gasol's twins nearly commit murder. We see this phonograph doll, which was a real thing at the time. People actually, there was a company that constructed dolls that had like a little phonograph attached to them. The technology was not ready for that yet. So the company soon went bankrupt. But for a time, these dolls existed. So we have this phonograph doll that can say mama. 
And then the gasless twins hide the doll in a well and pretend that a child has fallen into the well. And then, of course, you hear a voice, you think it's a human, it's not a human, the same joke. And again, here, see, there's no other use of sound, right? Sound is exclusively used for this one joke and not even using balloons. So the modern speech balloon actually uh, is first created, I would argue, in the Cats and Jammer Kids. And the Cats and Jammer Kids um, are often portrayed as having taken over after the Yellow Kid and immediately perpetuated this, this type of comic strip in the United States. But that's actually not quite true. So um, Rudolf Dirks, the author of the Cats and Jammer Kids, uh, for a while, even after the Yellow Kid cartoons, kept using mostly a picture story format or a pantomime cartoon like this. And we see here, even though this joke, uh, th this particular cartoon features a lot of conversations like here, here, and here, uh, there's no sound depicted at all. So at the time, again, cartoonists were using representation of sound only when the jokes necessitated them. But uh, Dirks, like other cartoonists at the time, also eventually starts making jokes about this, uh, what I call the voice speaker disconnect, where someone hears a voice, they think it's a person, it ends up not being a person, right? In this case, this, this, this literal balloon here that is painted with the face of one of the cats and Gemma kids. And here again, we have these speech lines, right? No balloons, even though this is clearly a representation of sound. And it's the same joke, though here actually the lines start originating from the kid's actual head. So Dirks makes that very same joke again a little bit later in April 1899, where the kids have a very similar idea. They strap dolls to this donkey and they cry for help. And again, uh, Mama Katzenjammer thinks that the cries for help are coming from this, from these dummies. So she hears a human voice, but it ends up not being a human. But note how now actually Dirks is using the sound and the words directly originating from the Cats and Jammer kids themselves. And I think this sparked an idea in Dirks because soon after this, um, he writes another Cats and Jammer kids episode where again, we have, we have shouting here, we have conversations here, again, not depicted using sound or balloons, but then he does introduce uh, word balloons here sort of making fun of Mama. These are German immigrants and Mama Cats and Jammer has a very thick German accent. So he, he introduces these balloons here. And this is pretty new at the time. There are some uses of word balloons like this in the Cats and Jammer Kids, but this is the first time that Derek's actually uses them in a sort of moment to moment transition in a single scene. And I think this now with the combination, the, the, this use of speech balloons, or word balloons to make fun of Mama Cats and Jammer's accent specifically, and the previous jokes about, the, about hearing a human voice and it not being not coming from a human is what gives him the idea to create this episode of the Cats and Jammers in August 27, 1899. And I think this really, rather than the Yellow Kid, is what should be featured in all histories of comics, because this is actually the first time that characters in such a story have a continuous, a continuing conversation over multiple panels that is represented by word balloons, which I think now are actually speech balloons, because we actually see, and this is this is a distinction between cartoons such as the ones that I showed earlier, where we have word balloons, but they're mostly used in allegorical context or directed at the reader. Here we actually see the characters hearing each other's speech balloons and then responding to them. And so this is a fundamentally new thing at the time. And even though it doesn't take off right away, it is picked up by uh, Fred Opper in his Happy Hooligan as well. And so from 1900, we have both the Cats and Jammer Kids and Happy Hooligan using this, this new form of storytelling where uh, you have stuff like motion lines and pain stars, but also these speech balloons where all sound now, not only uh, in jokes about hearing voices, but all sound is now rendered within the images themselves. And so this is a fundamentally new thing at the time that is so popular uh, that it begins spreading across the United States. So here we have examples of the Cats and Jammer Kids and Happy Hooligan and newspaper in Boston and Chicago. So this takes American newspapers by storm. And then we see other comic strips like these uh, spring up as well. And of course, audiovisual comics like these then start appearing in Japan as well. So for example, this is 
uh, Jimmy Swinnerton's um, Mr. Jack that is published in Japanese translation by Dr. Kitazawa in Tokyo Park in uh, 1908. And we also have some examples of Japanese authors imitating this format. You can clearly see from this header that it was inspired by one of these American comic strips. Um, this is uh, Mukuzo Imokawa or Imokawa Mukuzo in the, the Japanese order, um, written and drawn by uh, Dr. Kitazawa's disciple, Hekuten Shimokawa. But the, even though we have some of these examples of these comic strips in Japan in the early 1900s, they don't really take off until 1923. And so what happens in 1923 is, as I showed earlier, Bringing Up Father is introduced in Japanese translation in the Asahi Graph. And then a Japanese cartoonist by the name of Yutaka Aso, the same month creates the Japanese comic strip Nonki Natosan, usually translated as Easygoing Daddy or Carefree Dad. Um, the same month, and then that comic strip also takes off. And this is basically what really establishes these what I call audiovisual comic strips in Japan. So here on the left, this is the, the first uh, episode of Bring a Father published in Japanese when the Asahi Graph was a daily publication. Uh, a couple of months later, it becomes a weekly publication, and then it starts featuring the weekly, the, the Sunday edition of Bring a Father. And again, it's, it's published as a manga. It's understood to be an American manga, and it becomes the longest running manga in, in uh, manga pre-1945 manga history. And so we know that this strip was immensely popular in Japan, uh, not only because other Japanese cartoonists started imitating it, but also because uh, these protagonists were, uh, well, ubiquitous would be an exaggeration, but they're very frequently found in advertisements, for example, in 1920s newspapers. And not only in newspapers that featured Bring Up Father, but in virtually all Japanese newspapers, advertising a variety of consumer products like stoves, or uh, frozen fish, corned beef, this I think is some kind of bicycle gear, alcohol, uh, and uh, nutritional supplements. So uh, it was basically presumed by the, the companies and the ad agencies that were running these ads that virtually all Japanese adults would be familiar with these two characters. And in 1924, we even see a stage play adapted from Bring Our Father. This is Jiggs on the right and Maggie on the left. So this strip in the, the mid 1920s was a sensation in Japan and was basically the, the single most influential manga at that time. And of course the success of Bring Our Father, uh, the comic strip, not necessarily the stage play, quickly encouraged imitation of it. As I said um, earlier, within weeks of Jiggs and Maggie appearing in Japanese translation, Yutaka Aso, in request to his editor at a different newspaper, starts creating a similar comic strip. And we see that originally, uh, Nokina Tosan starts out in the what, what we still today know as the, the manga reading order, top to bottom, and then right to left, but this would soon change. She would actually start uh, using the same reading orders, bring up father as well. And this I've included because it also shows the, the fascinating connection right, between new technologies and these comic strips. Uh, this is an, an ad for radio equipment and it features both Jigs and the protagonist from Nokina Tosan uh, together in the same ad. And so like Bring Up Father, uh, Nokia Tulsan uses all of these elements that I think make up the, the archetype of modern comics. It uses sequential paneling. There's no uh, narrative text needed to explain what's going on. It uses motion lines. It uses these impact stars, uh, motion blurs as well here. And of course, continuing conversations using speech balloons over multiple panels. So it is through Bring Up Father and the Nokia Tulsan that this form of cartooning and of graphic narrative is established in Japan, which of course begs the question how relevant 12th century picture scrolls, ukiyo-e woodblock prints, or hakusai are to this history. So then, uh, because of the success of Bring Up Father and Nokia Tulsa, we have an explosion in these comic strips in Japan, which then replaced the picture story and pantomime cartoons as the, the primary form of manga. We've already seen Happy Hooligan earlier, and Adamson, but there was an incredible range of content that was published at the time. So for example, here we see uh, the comic strip Toots and Casper. This is Polly and her pals. This is Barney Google. We have Crazy Cat here, Mutt and Jeff, uh, 
This is a Mickey Mouse comic strip adapted from animated films at the time. So all this stuff is appearing in Japanese newspapers and magazines at the time. Here I've included some more uh, examples in case you were thinking I might have just selected the only ones that I could find. Here's Little Jimmy. This is uh, Tilly the Toiler. This is another animated cartoon turned comic strip, Popeye, obviously. This is the Tunerville folks. This is the Gums, which appeared in English in the Japan Times, but it was also read by uh, Japanese readers, which we know from letters to the editors in the Japan Times by people with Japanese names that mentioned it. This is Harold Nur's version of the Cats and Jammer Kids. Uh, and this is Henry, another American comic strip. So the, the prevalence of these comic strips and the popularity then just like in the case of Nokina Tosan uh, encourages other editors to ask their uh, local cartoonists to create similar material. And the, the best illustration of this direct impact of these foreign comic strips can be found in the many Japanese comic strips at the time that actually embrace not only the, the basic form using speech balloons and motion lines and stuff like that, but also even embracing the, the same reading order as the American strips. And even if you don't uh, read Japanese, you, can, you, you know that the reading order is the same because of these helpful panel numbers, which had to be added, of course, because of this simultaneous existence of two conflicting reading orders. So all of this, of course, begs the question why this is all omitted from uh, a lot of histories of manga, such as the one that I showed in the beginning. And one reason for this, I suspect, is that it ruins the manga's roots go deep narrative, but it's also um, because it, it skips the uh, period of the 1920s and 1930s and the 1940s and then you would have to talk about World War II, which is something that the Japanese government in its use of manga as a tool of uh, soft power and sort of to um, spread the cultural appeal of uh, Japanese manga abroad uh, doesn't really want to get into in part because of stuff like this. Nora Kuro, which I mentioned earlier, the third longest running manga pre-1945, which starts out relatively innocuous. It's about a little dog joining the military. And it was uh, directly inspired by Felix the Cat, by the way, which um, Kitazawa, Dr. Kitazawa started publishing as a replacement for Happy Hooligan in the Gigi Shimpo in 1930. Um, but as uh, Japan escalates its war against China, Norakuro actually starts becoming much more propagandistic. And so the dogs are a stand in for the Japanese army and the pigs are a stand in for China. And we see quite graphic depictions. This is the dog army celebrating the fall of the pig capital. And we see these depictions of Norakuru slaughtering natives. This is a recreation of a famous suicide bombing by the Japanese military. So this is, of course, stuff that uh, kind of complicates the use of manga history as a universal positive representation of quote unquote cool Japan. And by the way, this, this entire history that I've been illustrating of how these what I call audiovisual comics spread uh, in Japan, this is actually not unique. The same thing happened in China at the, at the time. It also happened in France. Uh, where American comic strips started, uh, I mean, they're, they're published fairly early in the early 1900s, but they really take off when uh, they're published in a French newspaper, especially Perry Winkle, but also the Gumps. And then we see the first French uh, comic strip that uses the same pattern in 1925, published in the same newspaper. And I mean, the, the direct influence is fairly obvious. So this is not a uniquely Japanese phenomenon. This is something that happens in a lot of countries at the time. And so why do manga seem so quote unquote exotic today? Why, what is it that has enabled this portrayal as, of manga as something that is uniquely Japanese that goes back centuries and centuries? And I think the, the primary factor in this is that the US comics industry was actually decimated by the anti-comics movement of the 1950s, uh, which led to over half of all American comics titles, which by that time were mostly appearing in so-called comic books, no longer in newspapers. Uh, so over half of those titles disappear. And the, the comics code that regulates the content of comics prohibits everything from disrespect for established authority to profanity, smut, and sex perversion. So anything that would 
remotely appeal to adults is banished from comics and comics become a medium in the United States that exclusively for children. Uh, for a long time. And this is, of course, a notion that's still not been fully overcome. Whereas in Japan, even though there's a similar moral panic in the 1950s, uh, the Japanese comics industry, which has shifted mostly to magazines run also by established publishers, not only by new comic book specific publishers as in the US, uh, the Japanese comics industry survives this moral panic much better than uh, its American counterpart. And so manga, Japanese comics are able to develop significantly more freely and overtake American comics in uh, their economic success and also in the range of content. And so these are, um, there were uh, dozens of comic book burnings in the US at, this, at the time and also at least one documented comic book burning in Japan but the, this anti-comics backlash in Japan at the time didn't exclusively focus on manga, whereas in the US, it was really focused on comics specifically. But in Japan, it was also focused on pornography and on movies. Uh, so even though it affected comics, uh, it, it wasn't specifically concerned with banishing comics. And as I've already alluded to, the structures of the two industries at the time were also quite different because in Japan, and we already saw this in the 1920s and 1930s, that comics in Japan, comic strips were also used to sell magazines rather than only newspapers as in the United States. And some of these magazines were published by companies like Kodansha and Shogakukan, which still today are uh, two of the uh, largest publishers of manga. So these, these structural differences between the two industries also help explain why manga was able to grow so significantly. And so, as I said, these roots go back to the 1920s when Kodansha, the, the biggest Japanese uh, manga publisher's magazine, Kingu, which at the same uh, at, at the time in the 20s was the, the biggest Japanese magazine, it was a general purpose magazine, um, featured from its first uh, episode, Little Jimmy, and then later also Adamson, as well as uh, a different run of Nokina Tosan, and then also comic strips by Suho Tagawa, the author of Norakuro. And of course, Norakuro itself was published in Shonen Krabu, which was another magazine by Kodansha. So we have these, these different structures of the American and Japanese comics industries uh, since the 1920s, essentially. And then they carry over into the post-war period and uh, together, of course, with other factors, such as the popularity of the work of Tezuko Samu, seen here, for example, but this, this transition of manga to magazines uh, that are not specifically concerned with comics, and then the, the lesser intensity of the anti-comics movement is then what enables this more or less unfettered growth in manga in Japan, outgrowing the American comics industry, and then enabling this depiction uh, of manga is something that is essentially from a completely quote unquote alien and unique culture as this shared history between American and Japanese comics recedes more and more into the past. So during this period of, of basically no more direct exchange between, or little, I should say, little direct exchange between American and Japanese comics between the, the 1950s and then until the 1980s when Japanese comics then are translated into English, this uh, direction of influence is reversed and manga then Japanese comics start influencing comics elsewhere. And just as a side note, uh, the manga style that is today seen as representative of manga also develops during this period from the work of Tezuka Osamu. Tezuka strongly influenced by Fleischer and Disney cartoons. Uh, for some of his early female characters, he makes the chins pointy and the nose pointy as well, slightly upturned, and he turns the, the large Disney eyes horizontally, and then sort of out of that develops what is now considered the manga style, the, the mainstream manga style. And so it's also this new style then that, of course, makes manga look completely different from American comics when manga starts succeeding on a global scale, uh, on a global scale including in Europe and the United States over the course of the uh, 1990s and the 2000s. And uh, that ends my talk. Thank you so much for your attendance and attention. Hi, great, thank you. If you have any uh, questions, uh, you can just drop your name in the chat and we'll try to take them in order. Uh, I mean, I could start. I, so 
What about Art Nouveau? I mean, do you think George McManus could have existed without Art Nouveau, which was highly influenced by Japanese printmaking, that, the, these stylistic things, and all these flat patterns? No, that's a, that's a really great point. Yeah, so these the international influence at the time are more complex than, than what I've illustrated. So um, there is influence like that, right? So Japanese art starts influencing art uh, elsewhere during that period, during the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. But for comics specifically, the direction really is, I haven't, I haven't seen any examples of, of Japanese cartoons or comics um, exerting any noticeable influence overseas uh, during that pre-war period. But you're completely correct that there are other artistic influences. So it's not, it's not as simple as all culture went from, quote unquote, the West to Japan at the time. Right, yeah, it seems like a pretty major stylistic influence. I mean, it's, you know, what I, and I, I mean, uh, the other question is, I don't know that everybody buys uh, Terry Smoldren's theory about speech balloons. Most 18th century art historians that I've spoken to think that some uh, speech balloons in Gil Ray are clearly dialogue. And there, there's tags that are worked in these kind of um, uh, ways other than dialogue. But then there are ones that are dialogue. And I think... No. It brings up this basic question. Do you think Shakespearean, a text of a Shakespearean play does not represent speech? I mean, all writing is sound, reproducing sound with, I think since speech probably predates writing, you could say, I mean, if all writing is recording the sound of human speech in some way, at least, um, phonetic languages, it seems strange to sort of say only when, tele when telephones were invented does it mean it's sound. It was always sound. As far as I can understand, the, the written speech in theater, it's all about dialogue and time. And it's clearly meant to be a record of what happened on a stage that people heard. It wasn't, it wasn't just read. So, I don't get this separation at all, but. Um... Well, I think the, the problem then is, or and I think it goes back to the, the question of sort of a, a definition versus an archetype, right? So you do see, there are cartoons where you could say, well, this seems like it could be sound, right? But then the question is, why don't we see comic strips like the ones that start appearing after 1899 earlier then? Because as we saw, pantomime cartoons existed since the oh. 1860s. Yeah, I think Picture pantomime stories existed. cartoons, there's a whole tradition in Western art of people removing text from pictures because they could sell them as high art. And that's kind of a uh, the history of, you know, why Hogarth didn't put pic words in, in his pictures. And he'd, he'd sometimes have them below his pictures. So I think that has more to do with this whole thrust of purifying graphic art than the idea that you couldn't do it. You could do it, it just did, you couldn't sell it as art and you weren't considered a pure artist if you put words in your pictures. You broke the, you brought, you know, everybody's attention to the two dimensionality of the thing. All the reasons art was purified in the West and uh, I think that's why I don't think it had anything to do with sound, but well, other okay, economic but then, reasons. So. But then, why don't we see conversations using word balloons earlier? Why do they appear only after these gradual experiments with jokes about well, sound recording I technology think, specifically? Yeah, I think in the West there was a strong impulse not to put text in an image, two dimensional text within an illusionistic image. And it doesn't have to do with sound. It has to do with the purity of the, uh, the form. But that's, yeah, that's sort of how I see it. But, um, but anyway, the other question is, were, were all um, 
how would you characterize the Japanese newspapers that carried American comics? Are they particular? Like, are they? Oh, are they they're, a particular they're, kind, or are they across the no, board? No, all, all. It was mostly it was mostly across the board. There is some correlation between newspapers that had a more cosmopolitan, more educated readership and featuring foreign comics, but uh, generally virtually all of the major Japanese newspapers at the time, at least in, in Tokyo and Osaka, I haven't really looked at regional newspapers outside of Tokyo and Osaka, but at least in, in the two major Japanese cities at the time, uh, virtually all major newspapers featured uh, such comic strips. Right, right, okay. I, I, cause I have no idea about the, the spread of, I mean, the whole range of what they were about, you know, and that's the, America, that's a, literary uh, papers like the times didn't carry comics, not once in a while, but not at the, you know, at the height of the newspaper world, they, they wouldn't have carried comics. So it was a more popular papers that carried them. Uh, and I guess, which is, a, I don't know if the same thing happened in Japan. It was like, a, the most educated wouldn't have had comics, especially foreign comics or, but anyway, that's maybe. And if I may say one more thing about that, um, I think the way then, it, if word balloons had always been understood as sound, right, that then also begs the question, why does this form specifically spread to Japan, to France, to China via American comic strips in the 1920s? Why doesn't well, since I've, I've had this uh, conversation with yeah. French American? Uh, yeah, that I mean, early, I mean, 19th century American periodicals were full of European cartoons. So, yeah, I mean, this is. I mean, it yes, went both. It's. Ways. I'm. I'm not American. I'm yeah. not making it. Oh I'm yeah. Not making no, I'm uh, saying kind it of went nationalist both ways. Yeah. So, whether they own, why? I. I think. Uh, I don't know what that has to do with speech balloons. That's just the form. There was silent comic. There was Henry that didn't have speech balloons. I mean, well, it's so, also uh, the, like. Oh wait, does somebody? Let's go back to the, to the chat so we get everybody in order let's start with uh ma brown Did, let me unmute you and you can ask your question rather than read it it's kind of boring to read it oh can you Hi. hear me yes please. yes okay well i wish i remembered what my let me look up my <laughs> question okay here it is um well first of all it was a stupendous talk thank you and i'm not a gusher thank you um i have many questions the first one to start is when they first showed um, American style cartoons, the early ones of the 20s and so forth, and when they were introduced and developed in Japan and the characters were known as American, as you said, were the Mer Americans then generally viewed as, buf as buffoons? Oh, that's, a, I, I mean, there is such a broad range. You mean well, the Japanese? Showed, many of the ones you showed, you know, the, the, the people are stupid, sort of stupid, and that's why they're funny, uh, sort of thing. Um, and so, to me, many of them are portrayed as. I mean, in in America, we think yes, these are people who are buffoons. But when you um, take it to Japan, does it basically saying Americans are largely buffoons? I I wouldn't think so. I mean, there is that that is actually an interesting question because, of course, that is a, a common element of many of these comic strips. But we also do see that in like the the Nonkina Tosan protagonist is also a buffoon, um, right? He's the easygoing daddy. He doesn't take things seriously enough. So that I don't think that that is specifically tied to the United States in the minds of the readers who are consuming these comic strips. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll withhold my other question till, I mean, Monroe has a question, if you want to ask, oh. or may he ask one? Uh, then sorry, may, sorry. Ask um, a question. Hi, uh, I could, could, could I ask you to escape your um, slideshow, unless you need oh, that course. up there, just so we can see the people. Yeah, uh, let me, how do I? That way we you can want see to everybody. See us at our various stages. Oh, not okay. being dressed up. Okay. 
So wait, you had another question? Right. Uh, for me? It's, this is Monroe. Oh, so, Monroe, did you have a question? Yeah, my question has to do with the occupation and the occupying authority. They were so strongly interested in messaging and symbols and relationships. I wonder, did they intervene? Did they subsidize certain art forms with respect to the comics or certain artists of the comics? Or did they employ the comics themselves in their messaging? Oh, did the did the American occupation use comics in, in its messaging? And in doing so, did they affect at all the tendencies that you're describing? But I thought also the Japanese no, no, no. <laughs> the authority is the MacArthur. So I'm not a I'm not an expert on the 1950s. Um, C.J. Suzuki would probably be a, uh, better able to answer that question, but I do know that um, I don't think that that the Americans explicitly used comics as a tool of influencing Japanese culture in the post-war period. But there were people like uh, Suritagawa, for example, or the, the editor of Shonen Kurabu, um, who, uh, Kato Kenichi, or Kenichi Kato, who was prohibited from working. He actually did work for another manga magazine in the early post-war period, but had to do so uh basically illegally because he wasn't he wasn't allowed by the american occupation of, uh, by the uh, ghq to actually work for a japanese publication because of his work uh for uh shonen kurabu during the wartime period so there were i mean there was censorship and there were certain things that, that you couldn't depict uh in comics at the time but the 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 basic form of these comics right was was established long before the end of world war ii even though in in most histories uh it is with the occupation it is portrayed the american influence is portrayed as having started with the occupation and i think that's the the main thing that is often cut out of manga histories is that the the primary influence of uh american comics in japan so the the adoption of this basic form actually happened about two decades before that. Okay, so question uh, from uh, Fumio Obata. I don't know if you wanted to ask that or. Um, actually, um, sorry, this is more, more like my opinion. Right. Uh, <laughs> rather than question. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not a scholar, I'm, I'm a comic artist. So. I couldn't really give a good. I just wanted to say thank you, really, because I had a long, for a long time, I had this idea of manga was actually originated from Western more than a lot of people claim because Hokusai, whatever. No, it's just a really it's a very modern thing, and um, it's very much connected to the, uh, uh, the the modern media like newspaper and magazines, which came with the Western influence when Japan opened up. And I think as I wrote in there, I think the Western machinery, the modern machinery, multi-printing techniques really helped to uh, spread, you know, there was media to spread beyond the major cities in Japan. So people started consuming it. And that was a big factor. Uh, and the other thing is, um, sorry, I'm, but this is just my opinion. I think the, the Japanese people are very familiar with cartoons to begin with because of our language system because our letters, they come from pictures. So we are very familiar with all these cartoon faces. So it was really easy for us to embrace the American cartoons. And this is probably my opinion. I mean, this is probably one of the factors in my opinion. But I could, I could, oh, I completely agree. I mean, the, the, the material conditions, right, that, that came together in these places, like uh, the newspaper industry, for example, like in order for these, these comic strips or any type of cartoons to actually spread and be a mass medium, you have to have the the publishing industry to, to enable that, obviously. So I, I think you're, you're very correct in pointing that out. I would be, I'm a little bit more careful with that argument about the, the Japanese language, because I'm generally more careful about these sort of uh, innate arguments or these, these deeply, that there are these deeply immutable cultural factors um, so I, I don't know. I haven't really seen, I mean, I've, I've heard that argument before, but I, I haven't seen any direct evidence. And of course, I mean, it would be hard to, to produce any evidence for that 
But yeah, there certainly were uh, a lot of different factors that have enabled comics in Japan to grow to the extent that, that they have. And of course, one factor may very well be the long tradition of line art, right? So during the, ever since the Renaissance, European art was dominated uh, by, by um, sort of non, non line art. I don't know what the technical term would be. Whereas in Japan, you have a much longer tra tradition of liners. So that may very well have been an influence. But I also think that the, the, the speed with which comics were embraced and also stuff like the reading order being adapted, right? And this happening also so, so quickly. Um, and then sort of American comics being so dominant in the 1920s and then slowly fading over the course of the 1930s as more Japanese authors were incorporating this form to me it also suggests that it was about this form. And of course, as I've also said, the same thing happened in France and in China as well at the time. So it wasn't something that was only limited to Japan, but it was only in Japan where comics have grown to this extent that now Japanese comics are the globally predominant form of comics. Very strange. <laughs> uh, it's in interesting. Thank you very much. No, thank you for your question. Question from um, Andrew. Andrew Field. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, so I was interested in what you guys were talking about in terms of image, writing, and sound, or like sort of speech and writing, and image. Um, because it's interesting if you think about it. Like the earliest known paintings like the cave paintings go back tens of thousands of years but the earliest written texts i mean i guess the i mean i don't know like in the eastern tradition the vedas are super old um but in the western tradition like the Hebrew Bible, for example, the Hebrew Bible was written way after at least what we've uncovered in terms of images, like, and even in terms of the Hebrew Bible, I mean, there was a written, uh, uh, oral tradition long before there was a written tradition. Um, and so it seems like the invention of speech balloons which is obviously the combination of image and language and forms of sound or speech, to my mind seems important to think about it in terms of the invention of new art forms like film and photography. Because film and photography were, and, and recording and record music because those are forms that changed how we thought about art. And, you know, we could say sort of um, dirtied the impurity of the image, right? Like it was like, there's the image, there's language. We've, we've had these traditions for a long time. Let's muddy the waters a little bit and make sort of hybrid forms or however you want to oh, say it. The, the theater yeah. existed before all of this stuff probably well, yeah it was dirty and, from the beginning i think yes and theater is is the best example uh, of right everything at this i mean a theater is yeah somebody theater. uh asked if this is part of a book yes there is a book and you have a copy there it is comics right that's this is a talk about this book so it's all in, it's a in, in much greater detail too yeah. especially the speech book stuff right so there is a book and you can find it uh, uh, in bookstores and online, I'm sure. Okay, there was a question. Oh, yeah, just, oh, just in response to Andrew, oh, are you familiar with, with uh, Jonathan Crary's Techniques of the Observer? No, I... Oh, that, I, I strongly recommend that book because that, that book is really exclusively concerned with this shift that we see in the 1800s, where sort of the, the entire... Uh, quote unquote Western conception of how the senses work and how how vision and sound work that all changes and 
And I think there's very strong evidence that that underlying change of the, the, the understanding of the senses is what enables not only uh, new technologies like photography and sound recording, but also, and this is the argument that Crary makes, that uh, cubism and impressionism didn't happen because photography made uh, photorealistic painting obsolete. It's because the underlying change in the conception of the senses enabled artists, both enabled the invention of photography, but also enabled artists to conceive of vision in different ways. That it's not that vision is a passive reflection of reality and you have to depict everything the way you see it. And I think that that, that same change that you see in sort of traditional art is also what triggers these changes in cartooning. And there is some, there's some, I mean, there are these examples that show direct connection between technology and these changes, such as the motion blur in Bush when he draws a story about the photography. But there's also stuff like Bush um, creating a story where someone sees sort of uh, colors when he's drunk. And this is something that Goethe talked about in his uh, theory of colors, which is cited by Crary as one of the texts that, that bring about this change in the, the European and American understanding of the senses. So these, these connections, I think are much, like they go on a much deeper level than, than I'm able to, to represent in this talk. And I think Crary's book is, is uh, excellent at, at explaining that much better than I could. I mean, we're trying to talk about forms of recording. Like, I mean, theater is a sort of record of one artist's sense of what is real or what's worth, you know, representing or expressing. But photography and film give it a new, I don't know if you call it a new transcription or like it's, oh, it's a specific recording right so when you write a, a theater script yes you could interpret it as a representation of sound but it's not a representation of a particular sound at a particular point in time i think that's the crucial difference it, 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 it gives a new meaning to repetition because you can listen to a recording like i've listened to bob dylan's like a rolling stone like zillions of times and every time i listen to it there's a sort of new aspect to it but it's not a live performance. It's a recorded thing. And that to my mind is a different, like to go to a theater and watch a play is different than to have a play recorded. I don't, I mean, I don't know, to my mind, it seems different, but it, I'm not saying it's, you know, the invention of, the, of a new wheel, but it does seem like a sort of, it, it complicates the picture, yeah. There's a question from CJ Suzuki. Hi. CJ, hi. Hello. <laughs> hey. Hi. So, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just curious about uh, uh, story manga uh, or Akahon manga pre in the pre-war period, since your focus was um, more about uh, comic strips in newspapers and, mag and magazines. So, um, um, Especially, I'm interested in how, how you understand, uh, how we should understand uh, the transition between, you know, from um, short form comics, which is a uh, you know, comic strip or in you know, the cartoons, to a much longer form of you know, narrative comics. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I think that's, um, I sort of alluded to that when I talked about magazines, but I think that's another factor that has enabled the growth of manga in Japan to the extent that it, that that has happened, where in stuff like Norakuro, right? So um, Norakuro was always several pages per issue, and then was collected into these longer stories, and it was more of a continuing story than uh, most newspaper comic strips, for example. And there's not there's not a clear dividing line. There, there are, for example, longer storylines, even something like Little Jimmy. So there is like a Little Jimmy storyline that goes on for at least I think ten episodes. Uh, that in in the the version that was translated into Japanese, but we do see more so in Japan than the United States an earlier shift towards magazines and towards longer stories, and then as you said, akahons, which are sort of um, I don't know how you would best describe sort of independent, very very small small scale sort of outside of traditional publishing uh, books, like a lot of the early Tezuka works, for example, were published as akahon, and uh, whereas in the U.S. there's a more, I mean, newspaper comic strips were collected into anthologies from a fairly early stage, um, even before comic books. But then it's really the, the shift towards comic books 
is much more abrupt in the United States. And I think also then the, the competition between a lot of comics publishers, comic books publishers, and the, the different specializations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that actually during the, the presentation tomorrow at um, a symposium at USC that that's, uh, CJ will also be a panelist for in case anyone's interested in that. But um, the so the specialization of some American comic book publishers uh, into horror comics and crime comics, and then others that publish exclusively family friendly material. So it means that they had conflicting interests. Right, the family friendly ones didn't care whether the horror comics, crime comics survive. Whereas in Japan, you have the content much more broadly distributed. There are, and again, I'm I'm not an expert, but at least as far as I know. Uh, there were no uh, none of the major Japanese children's magazines which published manga, which become the prime the primary format of publishing manga in the 1950s, had sort of content that was noticeably different. Usually, if something became popular, other magazines would would immediately copy it. And also because they were embedded in more traditional uh, publishing contexts, they're also and maybe also because Japanese people were more uh, having just come out of bombings at the end of World War II, were more averse to seeing very graphic depictions of violence. Um, so that also seems to have less popular in Japan at the time. And of course, the extremely graphic depictions of violence uh, were a major factor in what created this huge backlash to comics in the US. The question from Ian Gordon. There. Oh, and I want to credit I want to credit Ian for uh, telling me about the the periwinkle in in France stuff. That was that was all Ian's discovery. I just wanted to yeah. My question was more about um, the way that these uh, speech balloons or word balloons as speech goes hand in hand. Um, <laughs> We've really what I think is a marketing of comics by uh, using, uh, especially after the Yellow Kid, by using continuing characters like uh, the Cats and Jammer Kids, and and then later you get Buster Brown and and so on and so on, and I I think that's that's somewhat important, um, and it's yeah you know, I suspect it's that they go hand in hand rather than one drives the other. Um, and if I can just share my screen, uh, I'm not allowed to share my screen. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I'll let ben you. can enable me. Yeah, hold I just on. want to okay. show. Wait, I have to do one thing. I have to unpin. Uh, <laughs> I know I discovered you can't do that if you're somebody. Hold on one second. Okay. You should be able to do that now. Great. I just wanted to show people this image. Um, which is a uh, Opa cartoon. Uh, this is from 30th of December, uh, 1900. And to me, um, this is one of those rare moments where you see a smoking gun because after this cartoon, uh, by March, 1901, everybody in, in um, the comics, um, uh, the the funny pages, whatever you want to call it at that stage, uh, is pretty much using uh, speech balloons. And they, they, they become an absolute regular feature um, by 1901. So it, it's kind of a moment. And I, I don't quite know what it was, uh, but it's this is, to, yeah, this is, a time where you can see, um, I'll stop sharing that now, um, where you can see there's a transition and a very clear one um, from, from December 1900 through to March 1901 in the space of three months. There's a very uh, swift um, development. And when you think that everybody talks about, you know, that comics are starting in 1896 or whatever, it takes that long. Uh, for speech balloons to come in. And I'm, I would have to go back and check uh, exactly on the dates of the cats and jammer kids becoming uh, more and more prominent uh, in Hearst papers uh, to see if, if that's actually linked to it. And Dirks is uh, starting to use uh, speech balloons uh, more and more regularly following uh, 
uh, Oprah's, Oprah's use of them there. I'm not saying that's the first time they ever appear, uh, but it's, it seems a very key moment um, because, um, because it, it combines both speech balloons and text underneath. Uh, but again, it's not a continuing character. It's, it's one of Oprah's uh, kind of uh, one-offs. Yeah, the, the strange thing is there's still, um, oh, there are lots of comics, gag cartoons and the New Yorker still don't use speech balloons. So what happened? Why do you think, you know, the New Yorker, people who do those sort of single panel gag cartoons resist using speech balloons? And it's all about dialogue, those jokes. People oh, I think... I think that's actually that's a, that's a great point because I think in they're mostly single panel cartoons right and they're usually yeah, but... sort of there's so I what I think happens in the 1890s in these cartoons right that that joke about sound and then the the first conversation with the cats and jammers in 1899 and then as Ian pointed out as that that then spreads uh past 1900 uh is that really what's becoming prominent is a sound recording and then also cinema. So you start, um, people start uh, becoming acquainted with reproduce sound and reproduce motion. And that is usually absent in cartoons like the New York cartoons that you talked about, they're not really playing out a scene, right? There's not, there's generally no, no story that happens. There's, there's a single joke that exists exclusively on paper. And I think that's, it's kind of interesting because it's the inverse of what we see pre the 1890s where you have stories that don't use balloons and then you have single panel cartoons that use balloons whereas today it's essentially multi-panel stories that do use balloons because now they're understood as sort of recorded sound that is being played back as the story moves along whereas in single panel cartoons it's actually now the other way around where we don't see balloons anymore uh, because a, they're not really necessary. And I think it's also because now when people see a balloon, they think of it as sort of a, a, a recorded utterance that's played out in time. Yeah, I think it's a pure class distinction and they don't want these things to look like comics. Oh, sure. I mean, that, that, may, that may be very economic, well. It's all economics yeah. on that. And um, I, I think the big influence when you look at early American comics was theater. I mean, theater was something people went to all the time and the comics, they're staged like theater. So that's definitely the big um, mode behind them. Not They were not trying to be, they were trying to record what people could see at the theater on paper because uh, you could draw, you know, crazy characters. You didn't have to, I mean, crazy well, what's, characters what's, staged what's, like a play. Mm -hmm. There's a proscenium even. I mean, it's so theatrical that to think there was anything else, uh, I mean, pre, pre cinema, there was, it was theater. And, uh, well, so, I think we're turning a little bit in circles yeah. with this question because, so I'm mostly interested in stuff that we have direct evidence for, right? So I think there is all this direct evidence that shows these connections between these modern technologies of replicating sound and motion. And so we see how, right, how the jokes about the phonograph lead directly to the Cats and Jammer kids having a conversation. Right, and the, the, the staging, staging, staging is, is, the staging is, is theater. Yeah, but it's, it's not, speculative. It's not, but that's no, speculative. That's I mean, can you, do you have? It's called no, thimble theater. That's, that's they're, not they're speculative. You're, of, you're arguing that they're full of theater. You're arguing that, staging, that cinema yeah. is important for cartoons uh, and comics, but cinema is, is, is the child of theater. I mean, you can't the discount theater so if you're going to argue that cinema is important to comics. Sure, that's sure. nonsensical. And I guess the other thing is, lens-based mm. art predates photography by hundreds and hundreds of years. It's I mean, it like goes theater. Back to I mean, but then world. okay. Anyway, it's a these are complicated issues. Makes which, no sense. You know, I don't have to do specifically with the thesis of your book. Mm. They sort of go back to. Um, you know, this other lost piece of history. But um, anyway, let me see if there are any other questions. Oh, someone, Jonathan Ogenspiel has a question about dialogue. <laughs> I'm never quite sure which name, hey Ben, uh, I'm never quite sure which name comes up until oh, I'm yeah. in the Zoom. Good to see you. Um, 
so yeah, so I had a, I, I, am I coming through? Okay, yeah, my, my thing keeps muting again, but you guys can hear me right? Yes. Okay, great, okay, it's just some weird, okay. Uh, so I had a question, yeah, about, about the, if you've, uh, if you've done any uh, comparison or looked at uh, differences between uh, the dialogue as it um, both, um, uh, both uh, comparatively between comics, looking at uh, the the dialogue uh, in um, in manga versus the dialogue in American comics, or uh, how it might change in translation when it is a case of translation, and also comparing the uh, just the convention stylizations, uh, format, how close or how far from uh, actual in person human to human speech. Um, uh it may be um uh, so so the between uh the dialogue in in the in the early manga and in uh say literature or uh, newspaper the way dialogue gets reported in newspaper articles at the time or in stories that might be appearing in the same uh, publications as the uh as, as the comic strips are appearing if you've done any of that kind of comparative work I haven't really done that work specifically comparing it to other sort of interviews or other representations of what people have said. I have looked at the way that comic strips are translated. And um, of course, a lot of a lot of times uh, these comic strips were heavy, uh, had heavy use of slang, for example, right? So a lot of that gets completely lost in translation. And uh, there's stuff like Crazy Cat, for example, right? It's like, so much of what makes Crazy Cat uh, unique is is entirely gone in the Japanese translation. And I think, and there are even comic strips where if you read the Japanese translation, you can barely figure out what's going on. And uh, I think one of the reasons I talk more about that in the book is uh, that, for example, in the case of Bring Up Father, the, the editor that uh, originally licensed it from King Features uh, in one of his books talks about how he personally oversaw the translation and he made sure that episodes that he felt wouldn't translate into Japanese were discarded and were not used. So um, whereas some of the comic strips where if you read the Japanese translation, you're like, I don't, I don't understand what's the joke. Uh, those generally were much shorter. And I think what that shows is A, that translation and sort of making sure that the jokes translated into Japanese and were translated in a way in which people would actually speak in Japanese were a big factor in determining which of these American comic strips were more successful than others. And I think, for example, Adamson too, right? So Bring a Father was probably the most successful of the translations and the most successful manga of the time uh, because such great care was taken with its translation. And then something like Adamson was probably uh, the second longest running manga because it didn't require translation because there was almost no dialogue or any other text in it. So the jokes were usually purely visual. Um, as far as the, the, the sort of how natural the, the text was, overall, I mean, you always lose something in translation. The translation of Bring a Father was generally pretty good. Um, but I think um, one reason why American comics have started to recede over the course of the 1930s is, well, A, the, the changing political climate with rising tensions between Japan and the United States, but also because, of course, if you write original comic strips in Japanese and you're able to incorporate local events and local references, then that, that will be more successful. There's a great John Ashbery poem with a reference to Happy Hooligan, and I did not know that Happy Hooligan was a, um, an actual person, <laughs> and it's the name or an actual character in a comic strip, and um, and the poem is called Soonest Mended, and it's one of my favorite poems by Ashbery. And there's a great appearance of Happy Hooligan where he he just like shows up and makes sure makes sure that everyone is okay, and he comes along in a rusty green automobile. And then he sort of, it's great. It's it's like Ashbury at his best. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can one. you share the, the title of that poem? Or can you put soonest that in the chat? Mended. It's like. It's soon as mended? Soonest. It's, oh, it's soonest an old, mended. It's an old phrase. A, um, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. No, there's a really, there's an important question from M.A. Oh, Brown. Okay. How did you get into this? Oh, uh, so. Originally, I was mostly interested in questions of translation, actually, and especially uh, the translation of 
uh, sort of non-text uh, stuff that includes an audiovisual component like opera, film, and also comics. I mean, I've always been a, a comics reader, but I was never specifically interested in comics. And it was this question of translation uh, that then led me to American comic strips in Japanese. Because in uh, Fred Schott's book, Manga Manga, he does mention Bringing Up Father and also a handful of other comic strips. And uh, I found it really fascinating because, again, if you read most histories of manga, they just talk about Hokusai and Ukiyo-e and then 12th century picture scrolls. And uh, when I learned about these American comic strips translations, that seemed like that sounded much more plausible that there was actually a, this shared origin point between American comics and Japanese comics. So then uh, when I was still doing my PhD, I got summer funding to go to Japan and just look for more of these comic strips. And I found a bunch of them and they looked very similar to Japanese manga published at the time. And so I started to, to become really interested in the subject. And so I spent two years in Japan doing this kind of research. And then of course they started to wonder why were these strips so successful, right? Why was there this need to import all these American comics? Why, why was, weren't there just more picture stories that were already there? Uh, what made these comic strips specifically so popular? Right? Why not just create picture stories forever? And then also, so then I had to look into the origins of these American comic strips, which I was vaguely familiar with. Right? I'd read several histories of American comics, but I think, and this is, I think, why the discussion got a little bit contentious regarding that point, is that the same thing that I think is a problem with manga historiography, that there's sort of this broad view where uh, things that I think don't necessarily have the evidence to connect them directly are sort of linked in this longer chain. Um, and then the, the origin basically of the first comic strips that specifically looked like the ones that then became popular in Japan, right? What I refer to as audiovisual comics, where you have known external texts, you have speech balloons and all that stuff, how those specifically were created. And most histories of American comics talk specifically about the yellow kid. And then it's like, and then there were the cats and jammer kids. And that's that's the end of the story. So I was really interested because the the yellow kid and his new phonograph, that doesn't really, to me at least, it doesn't look like a modern comic strip yet. So then I started looking at this this whole process from, from 96 to 1990 when we have the first actual conversation in comics. And then at the years after that, as that and it wasn't even after that conversation, by the way, as Ian has pointed out, uh, both opera and Dirks for quite some time uh, only occasionally use speech balloons. And often when there were specifically vocal acts depicted in their comic strips, like singing or, uh, or a kind of accent that had to be represented a certain way. So when the, the oral quality of a certain utterance was especially um, particular. But so that's then how I started looking at the history of comics and graphic narrative more broadly. And then I also became interested in where all these, these pain stars came from at the motion lines. So from there, and I, I was really astonished that no one, at least to my knowledge, has, has had looked into that. So I started just looking through European and American publications, just looking for pain stars and looking for motion lines. And then of course you end up finding all sorts of other stuff like the, the Wilhelm Bush story about the, the photographer and stuff like that. Any other questions? It's 8.30, I don't wanna... We're in different time zones. I don't wanna... Oh, it's earlier for you, right, right. Anybody else? Any other comments? I think I got everything. In the Has this chat. been recorded, Ben? Yes. And it, will it be available if it, I wanna recommend it, it to people? Yeah, it's, a, it's up to Ike, but... Uh, yeah, I'm I'm totally fine. Oh, great. So we okay. can, yes, great. So, will it be available on YouTube or through yes, you? Yes, it's on the YouTube. Your... It's on the there's a YouTube channel for all of these comic symposia, so you can look there. That's where it will be. Okay. So there will soon be hundreds and thousands of people listening to this. <laughs> well, I don't know. We don't get that. I don't know. We don't buy advertising, so I don't think we get pushed. Well, I have a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, no, people listen to them. A lot more people watch this on YouTube or whatever it's called. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no other 
questions. <clears throat> Thank you. And you're you giving a that. talk tomorrow. Uh, oh yeah, do you want to plug that or is that? Oh yes, the there's a uh, there's a symposium tomorrow sponsored by the Ohio State University called uh, Global Comics and the Rise of Manga, if I'm not mistaken. So that's uh, tomorrow, uh, and it also starts. It's so I'm not entirely sure. I think it starts at six thirty uh, Ohio time. Uh, but if if you if you do an online search for uh, OSU Symposium Manga Comics, you'll you'll find the event page. Thank you, thank you very much. Great. Oh, thank, thank you, you for much. for attending. Thank you for your for the nice things you said and all your questions. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Micah and yeah, thank we'll you. See you all next week, and uh, good night. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.